connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. and welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour or so. Uh, Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to curate and convene and showcase excellence and innovation and new research from across the child and youth healthcare community with our goal as always to spark conversation, ideas and action. Uh, and since we are live, I do want to remind everyone you do have the opportunity to type questions into the question box at any time. Don't feel you need to wait until we call for questions uh, at the end or throughout. We we may take questions at any time. So so uh, go ahead and type those questions in as you think of them. And also, if you have any other comments that you'd like to share, uh, type those into the question box as well. But also feel free to share those on Twitter and be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. All right, so today we're going to be talking about how we can have better nights and better days for children with neurodevelopmental disorders, what, why, and how. Uh, and we're going to hear about sleep needs for children, sleep problems, and the impact of not getting enough sleep, and what can be done to help uh, children with neurodevelopmental disorders sleep better. Uh, and uh, this is actually a continuation of work. You may recall uh, the Better Nights, Better Days team joined us it was quite some time ago, I actually checked, it was almost two years ago uh, when they came, when they were first introducing their work. And this is a new phase of that work that's focused on children with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and this uh, this new work is is uh, funded in, at least in part uh, uh, by kids, our friends at Kids Brain Health Network. Uh, so thanks to our folks at uh, Kids Brain Health Network for supporting this kind of work. And Kids Brain Health Network, for those of you who don't know, is a national network of researchers and health professionals that are helping children with neurodis neurodevelopmental disabilities and their families. All right, so without uh, any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first off, I'll introduce Dr. Penny Corkum, who is a registered psychologist with a background in school and child clinical psychology. She's a professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And she's also cross-appointed in psychiatry, uh, and she's as, as well as being on the scientific staff at the IWK Health Center. Uh, in her day job, I guess you'd call it. She's also a psychologist and director of the Colchester East Hance ADHD Clinic, and she's one of the co-principal investigators for the Better Nights, Better Days uh, team. Uh, joining her is Sydney Dale McGrath, who's the project manager for the Better Nights, Better Days team based at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And possibly, but it seems almost unlikely uh, to be joining us, is Dr. Shelley Weiss, who is the other co-principal investigator for the Better Nights, Better Days uh, for Children with Neurodevelopmental Disorders team. Uh, Shelley is a neurologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and a professor in the Faculty of Medicine at University of Toronto and currently directs the Neurology and Sleep Clinics at Sick Kids. And apparently she's in the air potentially right now as her flight was delayed. So I'm not sure she's going to land and get to a computer in time to join us. But uh, if she does, we will welcome her. But in the meantime, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Penny Corkle. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Doug. Can everybody hear? Is the volume okay? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about Better Nights, Better Days for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. It's really exciting uh, to be able to talk about this because it actually coincides with our launch of uh, our e-health intervention for children uh, with neurodevelopmental disabilities and insomnia or, or sleep problems. And I'll talk more about that later. But um, so the timing is just absolutely perfect, and uh, really uh, appreciate everybody joining in. Um, so. Just before I start, I, I'm just sorry, I just have to, for some reason I'm not uh, able to progress. 
Uh, if you just click in the middle of the slide, sometimes uh, the, the control panel sort of gets put to the front. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so before I start, just a few disclosures. So uh, as Doug had mentioned, this uh, research is funded by Kids Brain Health Network, so we're very... Um, very grateful for that um, and eventually and possibly it may be commercialized um, you know to be able to disseminate uh, this product uh, to to uh, families across Canada and uh, further um, so that may be in the future and also um, the in initial funding came from CIHR so important to recognize all the different contributions and potential um, I guess, conflicts of interest. So uh, as Doug had mentioned, we did have a previous webinar. It was in May 2016, I believe, Doug. So that's quite a few years ago now. At that time, we were launching uh, our Better Nights, Better Days uh, project for typically developing children. And uh, we spoke a bit about uh, sleep and common sleep problems and the impact of poor sleep on typically developing children. And then we described the Better Nights, Better Days project and the trial that was coming out um, at that time. We have now completed that trial, so um, things have happened in the last few years, which is wonderful, um, but we have not finished analyzing that data, so uh, soon we'll have some data from that. Um, but you can uh, access that original uh, webinar through the uh, Ken uh, Knowledge Exchange Network, and uh, it has a little more detail about sleep, so I thought I would uh, start with just a refresher of uh, this information, just to make sure we're all on the same page and orient everybody to the to to sleep as a process. Talk a bit about sleep disorders and the impact of poor sleep. Again, focusing more on neurodevelopmental disorders, assessment, treatment, and then introduce you to our new program, uh, Better Nights, Better Days for Children with Neurodevelopmental Disorders, and then of course answer any questions. I am hopeful that uh, Shelley Weiss will be able to join us, at least for the Q&A, um, but we'll, we'll have to see. In Atlantic Canada, we have quite a, a weather happening, very bad uh, rain and wind, so uh, she may be delayed more. Okay, so to get started, uh, sleep structure, function, and regulation. So as probably all of you know, sleep is divided into two broad stages, REM sleep and non-REM sleep. When we think of REM sleep, this is our dreaming sleep, we'd often say. It takes up about a quarter of our sleep, and it happens in episodes across the night. It's called REM because it's characterized by these episodic bursts of eye movements. And so if someone's in REM sleep, you'll see their eyes darting underneath their eyelids. It's also associated with high levels of cortical activity, so our brains are pretty um, busy uh, during REM sleep, but luckily uh, most of our muscles are paralyzed so we're not acting out our dreams, although there is a disorder where that's not the case and it can be quite uh, problematic. REM sleep ha happens later on, so first we go into non-REM sleep and then end uh, each cycle with REM sleep, so it doesn't happen right away. And we think that the function is learning and memory consolidation. There's still a lot to learn about uh, functions of different sleep architecture, but uh, the research is showing that learning and memory consolidation would happen during REM sleep. Non-REM sleep uh, accounts for the other uh, three quarters of our sleep, and it's divided into three stages. So the first stage is this light um, kind of transition phase called uh, N1, or non-REM sleep stage one. Uh, stage two is really true sleep, so this is when we see um, on a polysonography, we'd see K-complexes and sleep spindles, which indicates that you're really asleep, and those protect us from waking up, so they reduce our arousal threshold so that we're not waken, awoken by sound, say, in our environment. And then N3 is deep sleep, and this is uh, thought to be more uh, where restoration of our body functions happens. And during this time, we have pretty low brain activity, and our body movements are preserved. So why it's important to know this information, um, in part, is because of it really helps give us information about sleep disorders. So for example, when we talk about a REM sleep disorder, we might think of nightmares. So during REM, during that dreaming stage, having nightmares, whereas non-REM, we might think of night terrors. And so this is a person who has an arousal um, from non-REM sleep. It's not really a dream, but um, an arousal. So it can look quite, uh, at some ways, some dif different, in some ways similar, um, but we might think about these different stages to differentiate different types of sleep disorders. The other important part to know is that um, we alternate through these uh, stages 
in cycles every night. And there's a brief arousal that happens at the end of each cycle. So we first go into non-REM sleep. Most of our non-REM sleeps in the first third to half of our night sleep. And then REM sleep is more towards the morning time or the later part of our sleep cycle. After each non-REM REM sleep, so after you see the dark REM bar, there's a little arousal. And this is thought to be kind of a time when we check in with our environment to make sure everything is okay. And so these arousals can cause problems for young children and, and even older children that they wake which is typical and normal, but they don't know how to self-soothe themselves back to sleep. So this is what might cause some of the night awakenings we see. So again, kind of important information to understand sleep problems and potential uh, treatments. So what makes us sleep? There's two processes that make us uh, sleep. The first is a homeostat. Think of it as uh, building pressure. So over the daytime, you build sleep pressure. And when you're sleeping, that dissipates. So the longer you're awake, the greater the sleep pressure. But that's not the whole story. We also have to think of the circadian um, system as well. And this is, there's times that we're most likely alert and most likely uh, kind of uh, tired. And we have to line these up. So if you think of the uh, shift worker who has been awake for a long time, so they have really strong sleep pressure built, but they're trying to fall asleep at a time when our circadian clock says, no, we're supposed to be awake and alert. And so it can make it really difficult. So when we're working with children, we need to line these up. We need to make sure that they're having good sleep pressure. So they haven't napped, say at seven o'clock at night or five o'clock um, so that they're ready to go to sleep. And we have to make sure that it, it's in the stage of their circadian cycle that allows them to fall asleep. So how does sleep differ in children with neurodevelopmental disorders? Well, there's lots of beginning research, I guess, on this topic, but it's very inconsistent. And it is inconsistent within different neurodevelopmental disorder groups as well as across different neurodevelopmental groups. So for example, there's evidence for more or even less REM sleep or non-REM sleep, depending on the disorder, even within a disorder, um, less stability of sleep so they can um, be aroused more easily more stage shifts, so those cycles I was talking about, that they may cycle through those quicker and have more arousals because of that. Maybe reduced production of melatonin, which is a hormone that helps um, with the circadian system and helps us sleep. Shifted circadian phases, so perhaps, uh, you know, they're, they're more night owls or, or larks. And increased or decreased need for sleep, so there's some evidence that some groups of kids may need more or less sleep. But the bottom line of this uh, research really is that there's no clear evidence for a physiological difference. Um, some research might find, yes, they have more REM sleep and the same uh, population might, another study might find they have less REM sleep. So it really, there's no current consistent data. And there doesn't seem to be a profile associated with a specific neurodevelopmental disorder. So we can't say, um, you know, for children with autism spectrum disorder, it's always this type of problem. Um, so lots of variability. I think this is a, um, an area that we need to learn a lot more information about. So a lot of people uh, ask, well, how much sleep does my child need? I think one of the first things I want to say is that there's no evidence that children with neurodevelopmental disorders need less sleep um, than typically developing children. So I think we can use the same um, information to try to guess and make an estimate of how much sleep a child may need with a neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, the chart that you see up here now is from the Sleep, sleep Foundation, the National Sleep Foundation in the United States, and uh, it's pretty widely used uh, recommendations and guidelines around total sleep time by age group. And you'll see there's a dark blue um, bar, and this is kind of the generally accepted range. The lighter blue bars are kind of um, the range of variability, most pediatric sleep uh, experts would say uh, focus in on those dark blue bands because that's really we, where we want to see children sleeping. In terms of a Canadian perspective, um, actually Canada and the participation uh, group were the first 
group to publish 24-hour movement guidelines that include its sleep as well as physical activity. So it's really exciting. I think this has led to lots of wonderful uh, research and clinical applications. They also provide some recommendations around sleep duration, which you see on the slide, and these are quite consistent with the National Sleep Foundation. I think one of uh, their documents that I found really interesting was a, a document titled, Are Canadian Kids Too Tired to Move? And I think this is really uh, gives a lot of food for thought. Just some of the key findings in their research in their 2016 report that I thought might be interesting to share. One is that children's sleep duration has decreased over time. Um, in the recent decades. And you'll see a little later in my presentation that even a small amount of sleep restriction can actually make a big difference in daytime functioning. So this 30 minutes may not seem like a lot, but in fact could actually uh, have significant impacts. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of our children are sleep deprived. About a third have a hard time even staying awake during the day. Almost a half are not getting enough sleep for adolescents on weekdays. And again, a third to almost a half of children have a hard time falling asleep um, and staying asleep um, at the nighttime. And we definitely know that sleep is an essential component of healthy cognitive and physical development. So they conclude their report saying, because many children are too tired to get enough physical activity during the day and not active enough to be tired at night, it's a vicious cycle. And I really... I really uh, think this is really important, especially if you think about kids with neurodevelopmental disorders who may have some access barriers um, to physical activity, which could impact their sleep. They also tend to have more sleep problems, which could impact their um, kind of availability or desire to engage in physical activity. So it can be quite a vicious cycle. So moving on to sleep disorders and the impact of poor sleep. In terms of a diagnostic system, people use two different approaches. So the DSM-5 or the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, both were published uh, most recently in 2013. And they actually line quite nicely in terms of overall categories. We're looking at 10 different sleep disorder groupings, everything from difficulties falling asleep, falling asleep too quickly, falling asleep in the wrong places, having trouble breathing while you're sleeping, not sleeping at the right times of days or right time of night, um, maybe during the day when you shouldn't be, as an adult at least, um, having disruptions in your REM or non-REM uh, sleep, restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movements, um, and then other uh, problems that are induced by medication. So we can see all of these sleep problems in all kids and all children with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, here's a, a list of some of the sleep disorders and the prevalence in children generally. So this is not specific to NDD. Uh, we actually don't have that data across all the disorders, but we do know that uh, the prevalence is much higher in groups of children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And sometimes it actually depends which neurodevelopmental disorder we're talking about. So for example, restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movement disorders are really common in children with, with ADHD. Up to two thirds of these children may have uh, periodic limb movement disorders based on the research um, out there right now. Another example might be sleep disorder breathing is very common in children with Down syndrome. So two thirds of those children um, are often or have been found to have sleep disorder breathing. What's really important to, to note is that insomnia is by far the most common sleep disorder in children, both typically developing children and children with neurodevelopmental disorders. So about 20 to 30 percent of typically developing children will experience insomnia, whereas this could be as high as 70 or even more percent of children with neurodevelopmental disorders. So this is the area that um, the Better Nights, Better Days team really has focused in on is insomnia. So what do we mean when we say insomnia? First of all, what we mean is just having difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking too early. There has to be some kind of impairment associated with this, so daytime consequence. It can't, because the child, it can't be because the child didn't have an adequate opportunity to sleep. And these sleep problems have to be frequent at least three times a week and chronic at least over a three month period. And they can't be explained by other problems. So when we think of all the factors that could be affecting sleep in children, 
I'm going to go through these factors, but think about um, children with neurodevelopmental disorders and how salient some of these challenges may be for this group of children. So first of all, if we think of the sleep environment, we know that um, you know sleep environment has to be cool, dark, quiet. Think about different um, socioeconomic uh, kind of status and, and the impacts of living in certain environments and how that might change. So if you're living close to a highway um, or if you're living in an uh, apartment building where there might be noise, et cetera. So these can have great impacts on our ability to sleep. Family and parents also have an impact. So uh, we know that uh, if parents are stressed, that may impact uh, the child's sleep. The child's health may have uh, impacts on their sleep. So if they have um, different medications can impact sleep. Uh, they could have something like reflux that could impact sleep. The child's development could uh, have an impact on sleep. So, for, for example, um, developing object per permanence, knowing that the, when a parent leaves, they're not really gone, they're coming back, could change uh, separation anxiety, could change how a child uh, is able to fall asleep independently. The child's social emotional development, their attachment, their temperament can have impacts. Social cultural um, factors such as parenting practices and, and values can impact sleep. And sleep practices obviously are uh, a big part. So the schedules, the napping, whether we co-sleep or not, can all have an impact on the child's sleep. And so when we think of this, we think of the three Ps. So what's predisposing the child to sleep problems? what's precipitating these sleep problems and what's perpetuating these sleep problems. And I think when we're talking about children with neurodevelopmental disorders, it's much more complex. And we really do need to think of all the factors that could be um, contributing to their sleep challenges. So in terms of the consequences of poor sleep, um, very uh, happens at different levels. At first, we'll talk about the child. So there's a small body of research looking at experimental sleep manipulation where we restrict sleep in children to see the impact. But there's a large body of research that looks at correlation. So poor sleep's associated with, with what kind of daytime functioning. And what we've found in both the correlational uh, research as well as experimental research is that children who are not sleeping well have lower um, learning, they tend to not be doing as well at school, they have some uh, cognitive challenges, so more memory problems, more attention problems, and so definitely you can see how this could impact their day-to-day -day functioning, uh, maybe particularly at school. Children with poor sleep also have more mental health problems, so they have higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of emotional regulation difficulties. They can have more physical health problems, such as metabolic issues, and overall just a lower quality of life uh, when a child is not sleeping well. We also know that it has a pretty significant impact on the family. And so parents of children with neurodevelopmental disorders who also have a sleep problem tend to have even more challenges. So they're, they themselves tend to be sleeping, sleeping less well, and uh, their siblings, uh, the child's siblings that is, uh, tend to be sleeping less well. Parents tend to have increased stress, more mental health challenges, and tend to resort to sometimes more negative parenting strategies. If you think of a tired parent, um, they're going to suffer from the same kind of daytime consequences as a tired child, so having more difficulty regulating their emotion. And so parenting becomes more difficult for these, for these families. This can also, a child's sleep problem can also affect the child at school and also community or society more generally. So for example, parents taking off more time from work because they haven't slept well the night before. So in summary, um, in terms of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, they tend to have a much higher prevalence of sleep problems than typically developing children. They tend to have insomnia at very high rates. The causes are really unknown. I don't think we can say X causes sleep problems in this particular neurodevelopmental disorder, but rather, um, we know that it can be multifaceted. There are some theories that I talked about or some evidence that there might be some difference in physiology of sleep, but there's also all those predisposing, perpetuating um, factors that might also uh, impact their sleep. 
We also know that in terms of negative impacts, the types of things that are impacted by sleep problems or lack of good sleep are the problems that many of these children are already having. So for example, with emotional regulation. So many children with neurodevelopmental disorders have emotional regulation challenges, but if they're not sleeping, these are gonna be even um, more problematic for them. I think the other thing we really have to consider is that sleep can impact other treatments. So a child may not be ready to learn if they're not sleeping well. So if they're um, receiving tutoring or one-on-one -on -one, uh, interventions, uh, uh, behavioral interventions, let's say, if they're not well rested, they may not actually learn these strategies as well. So another reason that we really need to, to address sleep problems. And I think the other important part is that for typically developing children with sleep problems, these tend to be more transient, but for children with neurodevelopmental disorders, sleep problems tend to be more chronic and don't come and go as often. So I think this is a really important point. So moving along to assessment of sleep, um, so first of all, we do have to do some screening, really recommend that uh, healthcare providers are screening um, for sleep for all children, um, especially children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And then we need to uh, do a sleep assessment when we find children who are having sleep problems through our screening. And we can use measures that are more subjective, like interviews and questionnaires and sleep diaries, or more objective, like actigraphy and polysomnography. And it really depends on the purpose um, of your assessment, which measure you may use. I'm just gonna go through some uh, examples very quickly. So some screening tools, there's a wonderful screening tool uh, by uh, Judy Owens and her group called Bearers. And this is just a nice uh, mnemonic to remind the healthcare provider to ask about bedtimes, excessive daytime sleepiness, um, any kind of uh, problems during sleep, regularity and quality of sleep and snoring. And we have found in research that if healthcare providers are asking these questions or identifying uh, sleep problems with much higher frequency. Uh, this is just a picture of the scale. So you can see there's questions uh, that the healthcare provider can uh, ask a parent of a child of a preschooler or school age or adolescent. Another uh, measure, screening measure, is this uh, sleep uh, breathing uh, problem scale created by uh, Dr. Colin Shapiro and his group at Youthdale Child and Adolescent Sleep Center. A really nice, uh, quick screen for sleep apnea, which can be uh, quite problem highly frequent in some neurodevelopmental disorders. We can also use questionnaires. Now, the vast majority of questionnaires are not um, not validated for neurodevelopmental disorders. So uh, these are two reviews of those questionnaires, um, but most of them are not validated for NDD population. An exception for this uh, would be the Child Sleep Habits Questionnaire, which was created by, again, Judy Owens and her group. And there has been a modification of this for children with autism spectrum disorder by um, Beth Mallow and her group. So, so I think we're seeing more um, of these measures being validated for uh, different neurodevelopmental disorders, but uh, still have a long ways to go yet. Sleep diaries are often used in clinical practice, and I think they're a really wonderful way to look at the consistency of sleep over time, the patterns of sleep problems it can be quite helpful in terms of diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, you can download one here at sleepforkids.org. Um, and it's a pretty simple graphic one where the parent just shades in the times the child was asleep. So it's a nice visual representation of sleep regularity. Um, this is one that we've used in our research, a little more details about um, the types of problems the child might be having during sleep. Uh, this is a more objective measure. It's an actigraph, so it's a wristwatch-like device that measures movement, and then from this we can tell if a child's awake or asleep. We can't tell if they're in REM or non-REM sleep, but we can tell whether they're, they've been um, sleeping or not. And it's becoming more popular uh, clinically, but definitely used a lot in research. And the graphs here, the dark blues, are just showing um, the sleep time. So you can see in the left-hand side, this would be a pretty consistent um, sleeper, and the right-hand side, uh, quite problematic. And the last one here is polysomnography. So this is considered the gold standard. Um, you're collecting information about brain waves, about oxygen levels, heart rate, 
um, limb, uh, so arm and leg movements. And again, not needed for all diagnosis of all sleep disorders. Um, for example, insomnia, you rarely would need a, a polysomnography to make that diagnosis, but for sleep apnea, you may, you may need this. So moving on to treatment, um, and I, I picked this picture just because I think uh, it's a little bit uh, overwhelming and scattered. So hopefully I'll be able to provide a, a structure for approach to treatment of insomnia. When I think of it, I really think of it as a, a kind of stepped approach. So first you have to address any other concerns. So for example, if a child had reflux, um, you may wanna uh, address this because that may be causing some of the sleep problems. But then you want to do psychoeducation, so teaching the parent about sleep so that they know what's typical, what, what should they expect. Sometimes there's just a, a mismatch between expectations and the child's sleep. Then you want to move into healthy sleep practices or previously called sleep hygiene, so making sure that the environment's conducive to the child sleeping, that the, there's routines and schedules in place. And if this doesn't work, you, we kind of move to a more intensive level of intervention through more behavioral strategies. So these are um, using learning principles uh, to help the child sleep better. And kind of the last uh, approach for intervention should be medication. Um, and this would be both prescription medication as well as over-the-counter medications. Um, but unfortunately, uh, if you turn the triangle around, that's the typical practice is that often these children uh, are prescribed medication first rather than uh, using these behavioral strategies that we know can be effective. And this is particularly true for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And in fact, it's only about, or it's estimated that only about 15% of children with insomnia actually receive evidence-based treatment, which is really quite concerning given that we know what works. So let's just go through those steps uh, of the intervention um, triangle there, a little more detail. So psychoeducation, again, wanting, uh, you know, trying to share with parents uh, all your knowledge about sleep so they understand sleep, so what is sleep, how much is needed, the different stages, roles, sleep associations, what happens if we don't get enough sleep. But with children with neurodevelopmental disorders, and they're always the ones in blue or aqua, um, we might want to expand this a little bit. So talking about other common sleep problems like, like periodic limb movement disorders or obstructive sleep ap apnea, the impact of other medications on sleep like medications used for ADHD can impact sleep. The interactions uh, between insomnia and neurodevelopmental disorder symptoms such as emotional regulation and inattention and dealing with safety issues that the child would leave the bedroom. The second step is healthy sleep practices. And in my lab, we created a mnemonic to help us um, kind of organize this information. So basically, we have subsumed all the healthy sleep practices under uh, these headings. So age appropriate, bedtimes, wake times, and naps with consistencies, with consistency, schedule routines, location, no electronics in the bedroom or before bed, exercise and diet, positivity and relaxation, independence when falling asleep, all needs met during the day, and this would all equal great sleep. And we've done literature reviews kind of um, supporting uh, these constructs. This would be an example of something that's really important for many children with neurodevelopmental disorders is using schedules, and the type of schedule might depend on the child's cognitive and communication abilities, so you might use pictures or, or text or even concrete representations of um, the sleep uh, schedule. In my sleep lab, we're developing um, a resource called the ABCs of Sleeping, where a parent would go online and fill in a questionnaire Based on this questionnaire, a sleep report is generated, and so this compares their answers to what is known to be the best for a healthy sleep, and they're given a one, two, or three stars on each of the areas. Any area that's not a three star, they have some handouts that can help them work on these areas. And so we've done some testing on this, and it's uh, proving to be quite effective, um, but we're uh, doing some additional research. So if anybody's interested in this, we'd love to have people participate and could just email us at sleepabcs at dell.ca. And what we're going to be doing, this is um, going to be all automated online. So we're trying to get parents to use this, um, use this program and give us feedback about whether they felt it was helpful. 
Thirdly, uh, and the third step would be using specific behavioral interventions. And just given the time, um, and this is quite detailed uh, and a lot of uh, information, I'm going to go through this very uh, briefly. And um, there's uh, two references that, that provide much more details about this. So basically the goal is combining different things such as developing positive association, so bed is for sleep, establishing routines and schedules, and implementing relaxation and self-soothing skills. Very strong evidence for this in typically developing children. 94% of all the studies um, conducted, these are uh, group trials, uh, have been effective. And 80% of these children have shown clinically significant improvements with these strategies. It improves sleep onset, how long uh, and how, how often they wake up at night and sleep efficiency, so having quality sleep. Um, the improvements last at least three to six months because that's been shown in research, but there's very few group randomized trials for children with special needs or children with neurodevelopmental disorders. We just uh, finished a review where we looked at what evidence there was in the neurodevelopmental disorder population, and we included all um, studies, so these could be single case studies even, and there was 40 in the literature, and every one of them found that children sleep improved with the use of these interventions, so that's really exciting. <coughs> um, this is a description. Um, I'll actually send this as a PDF, and um, they can put it on the uh, handout uh, link, and so that you can uh, download it, but I think for now, uh, I'm going to just uh, skip over that. And I just wanted to show like a reinforcement uh, chart and talk a bit about this because this is a really important part of uh, sleep um, treatment. And with children with neurodevelopmental disorders, you want to just make sure that the rewards are more salient and more immediate and that there's more visual tracking of rewards. So this is a program that we used with um, children with ADHD. And so we were giving them um, stickers for following the bedtime routine, falling asleep within the right time, sleeping through the night and staying in their bed until it was time to get up. And they got a reward uh, depending on how many stickers they got. So typically when we're implementing these strategies with children with neurodevelopmental disorders, we want to make some modifications. We want to make sure that the language is adapted to the child's communication ability, that we're paying attention to some of maybe their resistance to change, that's more step-by-step, -step, more concrete, the rewards are more immediate and salient, like I just mentioned, more uh, time to implement the strategies. These children may take a longer time to actually learn these skills using more visual charts and even social skills or social stories. And lastly is medication. So really we want to try to leave this as our last uh, line of intervention if everything else fails. And we always want to pair it with those behavioral strategies, those healthy sleep practices when it's needed. But we have to know that in fact, there is no medication approved for treatment of insomnia in children. And there are some concerns about safety and side effects. So, so we really only want to use the, this intervention when absolutely needed. And in fact, Choosing Wisely Canada has uh, included um, using medication for the treatment of insomnia, particularly antipsychotics, as one of those things that we really want to try not to do. So, so I think we're recognizing the importance of using those behavioral strategies more so than uh, medication. And this is particularly true and children with neurodevelopmental disorders are way more likely to be, to be prescribed a medication for sleep. So what about over-the-counter medication? So I'm sure um, everybody has heard of melatonin. Many uh, children with neurodevelopmental disorders are on melatonin. Um, just I guess a, a word of caution, while most of the studies out there show benefit and few side effects, there's actually not so many studies and most of them have small sample size and don't really look at long-term use. So the Canadian Pediatric Society position paper on melatonin says that really we should start with uh, healthy sleep practices and behavioral strategies um, before using melatonin. And they give a caution that we still really don't know um, everything there is uh, to know in terms of its usefulness and its side of safety kind of profile. So, so this should not be our go-to when we treat uh, sleep problems in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. 
So for the last five minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about our program, Better Nights, Better Days. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, um, we had launched this uh, a while ago, and this is an e-health program, and by that I mean it's delivered via the internet. It's not a website, it's an actual program that a parent would work through, like they would work through with a clinician or a healthcare provider. Uh, this initial study was uh, funded through CIHR, and so I'm going to tell you a bit about that and then tell you about our, our upcoming, and, or current one I should say, uh, for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. So like I said, it's an e-health program. A uh, parent can access this on any kind of electronic device from a computer to a smartphone. It consists of five sessions, kind of following that triangle I went through. So starting with psychoeducation, then healthy sleep practices, and then the behavioral strategies, and then um, some relapse prevention types of stuff. We don't use medication in Better Nights, Better Days, but at the end of this treatment, if it wasn't effective, then that might be an option, particularly uh, for children with neurodevelopmental disorders, if they don't respond to this, but many of them will. Um, the uh, intervention, there's no coaching, but there's actually a virtual coach. So this is Ashley, and Ashley is both a real person who is in the videos as well as a cartoon person, and she acts as a guide to the parents through the intervention. Most of the information is provided in animated uh, videos or uh, through expert videos. Some of the information is in text, but when it is, it's very dynamic. So in this particular example, um, you can click those bubbles and more information is provided. There's a lot of interaction. So in this particular example, this is a goal setting activity. So parents set the goals that they want to accomplish, and then they can reevaluate these goals as they go through the program. And they also get feedback about how they're meeting these goals. There's some nice interactions like building a, a routine, a visual schedule, if you will, for, for a bedtime routine or a wake time routine. So it's a drag and drop type of um, interaction. We also have something very similar for a reward program that can be built. And there's a sleep diary. So they complete this every night so that they can track their child's sleep and see how their child's progressing. At the end of each of the five sessions, there's a session plan that they download. And this is, um, developed based on their responses through the session. So this is what they're supposed to do for the next upcoming week to two weeks. There's also a download button so they can get a, a text summary of the information that they learned. And last but really important is this roadblocks document. So this is really to replace in a way the coach. These are the stumbling blocks parents might come across when implementing the strategies and ways around that. So really important um, kind of problem solving uh, that needs to happen for many families is located in the roadblocks. So as I mentioned, we ran a randomized control trial for, in Canada across uh, all the provinces from uh, September 2016 to October 2018. And the goal was to improve children, we wanted to see if this improves children's sleep and improves their daytime functioning as well as the, the outcomes for the caregivers or parents. Um, so we enrolled 533 families, um, including parents of toddlers, preschoolers, and school-aged children um, from across all regions of Canada, and uh, some uh, were French-speaking, some were English-speaking, so this program is uh, available both in French and English, and we randomized them into either the treatment group or a standard care group where they could only, um, they couldn't access Better Nights, Better Days, but they could access other so resources as they as they would typically do. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we do not have the data analyzed, but um, we have been uh, starting to organize the data and getting close to analyzing it. But I just wanted to share a little of the qualitative feedback. Not to say there wasn't any uh, constructive feedback, because there was, um, but most of the constructive feedback really was about some of the research components, like having to where the active graph can be hard for some children, for example. Um, but generally, parents are really positive about the program, and I won't read all of them, but um, you can see the first one, uh, when we asked about the program, they said the fact that it actually works, my child sleeps, so they're pretty exciting. A lot of people liked that it was clear and programmatic and step-by-step, -step, and as a family, they're all sleeping better. Um, so lots of nice positive um, options or uh, comments. Um, some parents really liked the options, so there's not one way of doing this program. There's 
it's a very complex program that allows for many different options and different branching in the back end. So parents um, can pick strategies that work for them and their family. So we were funded through Kids Brain Health Network to to modify Better Nights, Better Days for children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And we selected four different groups. So ADHD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, Fetal, fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, and Cerebral Palsy. We picked those groups because they uh, the last three in the list were the focus of Kids Brain Health Network kind of more traditionally and uh, ADHD is an uh, area of my own uh, research so I wanted to add them in and we also like the variety if this could work as a trans diagnostic intervention so one intervention that's modified for each group but is also general for all groups if it could work across these four very different disorders and we really felt that it could work for um, children with neurodevelopmental disorders more broadly speaking. So how did we do this modification? Well, we conducted four research studies to help us decide what needed to be modified, what needed to be added, what needed to be taken out. Um, we looked at the systematic, we did a systematic review of the literature. We did a Delphi study. We went out to those experts in pediatric sleep with kids with neurodevelopmental disorders and asked them, what do you think needs to be included? Um, we did focus groups with healthcare providers that would actually be uh, suggesting this intervention, as well as with parents that would be using it. And we did a usability study where we asked parents to actually use the intervention and give us feedback. We took all the information that we had uh, collected from all of these and we had two big meetings with our team and this team included uh, clinical researchers but people who practiced who did research in the area and we decided how to modify uh, Better Nights Better Days so that it would be appropriate for parents of children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And so back to our triangle in a way, this is a different triangle, but we started with the core Better Nights Better Days program. Then we added in cross-diagnostic modifications. So these would cut across all NDDs like for example more time to complete the intervention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we added symptom specific modifications. For example, many kids with uh, NDDs have difficulties regulating emotions, so we put in information about that, or have difficulties paying attention, or difficulties with um, relaxation. And finally, we added in diagnostic specific information. So a good example of this might be for children with autism, um, if they had to find um, something for the child to do um, when they are taken from their bed for one of our strategies. Um, this might be hard because of their fix it, uh, kind of uh, more uh, focused uh, interests. So how do we work around that? So anything that we had to really think about the diagnostic uh, information. So now we're at the place where we're actually uh, launched the uh, program and we're trying to recruit um, folks from across Canada to participate. And what participate, what this might look like or what we're hoping it will look like is about 320 parents of children ages 4 to 10 years of age with insomnia symptoms, so difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep, or early morning awakenings, and a diagnosis of one of those four neurodevelopmental disorders. Parents would be asked to complete assessments at three times, at baseline before the intervention, four months after the intervention, and eight-month follow-up, and they receive some information. Uh, uh, honorarium for doing those measures and at each assessment period they would have to do a sleep diary for seven days for their child's sleep. The child would wear an actograph and they'd have to, the parent would have to answer online questionnaires about their child's sleep, their child's daytime functioning and also the parent's daytime functioning and kind of um, tiredness and uh, they would all have access for eight months. However, the because it's a randomized control trial only the intervention group would have it for the first eight months and then uh, the usual care group would get it after uh, that eight month period so kind of what to expect the first they would go on to better nights better days and complete eligibility then a baseline assessment would be conducted to make sure that they're a good fit for the intervention then the families are randomized either to intervention or usual care and then there's the four month and eight month follow-up and uh, I also just want to acknowledge the Better Nights, Better Days uh, team. And so these are the folks that were all involved in uh, modifying the program. Um, and uh, you know, I think it was a great collaboration across different disciplines and across Canada. 
And a little more information about uh, the new program can be found at these different uh, social media spots. Um, but going to the website is where parents would actually indicate uh, their interest in participating. And there is a downloadable resource and at the top of li resource list, on the top of that resource list, um, this information is there, so you can get it there as well. And I also just, uh, while I have all your attention, want to plug our uh, new study, which is looking at uh, a program for youth, so between the ages of 14 and 24. And this is a bit of a different approach. It's called uh, micro-learning, so it's bit-sized learning um, about uh, sleep and interventions. And so we're going to be doing a usability study to see how it works for uh, adolescents and young adults who are um, in post-secondary or at university or college. And so if you have anybody that might be interested in that, they could email us at the address uh, here. And I just want to finish uh, my talk with a thank you of, and acknowledgement of all the uh, people that really played a critical role in developing these programs. So up top is the Better Nights, Better Days uh, NDD team. And uh, in the middle is the uh, typically developing uh, version team. And in the bottom is my research lab with uh, my uh, trainees and uh, staff who've all uh, been involved. And again, uh, obviously, thanks to Kids Brain Health Network for um, their support of this research. I think with that, I have uh, spoke a lot. I hope not too fast. And we have about 10 minutes left for questions. All right, thank you very much. Great presentation, a great recap of uh, where we were a couple of years ago with the uh, the previous program and, and, a, and a great update re related to kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, so uh, really fantastic. Um, for the, Just a, a question for the last, uh, uh, the new study related to youth, I just wanted to clarify, is that for uh, typically developing youth or youth with neurodevelopmental disorders? Yeah, no, typically developing youth. Um, so we always start there and make sure it works and then do modifications uh, after that. So for now, it's just uh, children who are who don't have a disorder, a diagnosis of any uh, other mental health or neurodevelopmental disorder. All right. So we do have a number of questions here. So uh, again, uh, if you do have any other questions, uh, type them into that question box. We have about eight minutes or so uh, to get through uh, through these questions. Um, We'll sort of start in reverse order just because it was most fresh in, in our minds when you were talking about the the the, the neurodevelopmental disorder study. Uh, you were talking about the diag um, sort of the modif as, as with that pyramid, the uh, the diagnostic modifications near the top or symptom modifications that you were doing. Was okay. there anything interesting related to kids with cerebral palsy and that they might be slight, somewhat different from the ADHD, ASD, and FASD, and that they have the physical component, uh, the physical disability component, the motor component um, that would affect their that potentially affect their sleep. Was there anything interesting or unique about the cerebral palsy population uh, in that respect? Yeah, I think um, in the modifications, probably, um, you know, that that group is probably the most different from the others in terms of the types of modifications that would be required. So it was an interesting uh, challenge to include all of that. So, for example, um, comfort and pain are so important um, to make sure that there is no pain or, or you know, the pain is uh, uh, minimized um, in terms of sleeping position and that, that sort of thing. So we do have, in particularly in the roadblocks, but also throughout the whole program, um, there is specific information for parents of children with whatever disorder you identify. So um, we would provide all that information for a family of a child with CP. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, yeah. You were talking uh, about halfway through about uh, the on uh, about an online questionnaire um, to document sleep disorders. Is that available through the website or? Yeah. So. Um, so that's a bit of a different project. So it's called the ABCs of Sleeping, and it's more of a it's more of a self-help program for <laughs> parents. So uh, they go in, they fill out a questionnaire, and then automatically gives them feedback about their child's sleep and what to do. Um, and so that you actually access from a different point. But if you send us an email, if there's interest, we would um, give you the information about where you could access that. But it it's more of a I see it as more of a first step. So, you know, before doing like a big, you know, five or 10 week program, this would be something um, to try out first. Okay. And that is available through the Better Nights, Better Days.ca uh, website? 
No, it's not. You have to email us. Can oh. you still see my slides if I go yep. back? Or, or yep, not? Okay. I'll go back to it so they can write it down and I can also, um, let me just get to it. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so sleepabcs at dell.ca. And so this is just still in the research phase. And so we're looking for um, parents to participate. And uh, if the parent reached out to us, we would give them the link of uh, how to access that questionnaire. All right. Um, the next question was asking, with respect to any of your current studies or any of your previous studies, do you also document the parent's sleep as part of the data collection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we had lots of discussions about that uh, when we when we head out to, you know, develop these. We we even at one point discussed treating, you know, or providing kind of treatment recommendations for parents' sleep, but we really wanted to make sure that um, we focused on the child, and any improvement in the child in the parents' sleep was because of the child's sleep. So we we haven't included strategies for the parents, but we did include um, tracking the parents' daytime functioning more. So are they uh, rested, and do they feel more alert during the day? So um, yeah, we're looking at their sleep, but not intervening with their sleep. All right. Uh, we've got a question here from a parent uh, of a five-year-old girl with ASD, uh, chromosomal disorder, epilepsy, et cetera, who wakes every morning at 5 a.m. and they, she's wondering, regardless of what time she goes to bed, I'm just wondering if you have any pointers or tips to extend that uh, the, the waking time so she's not waking quite so early. Uh, she did also mention that she's on low-dose Keppra for seizure control as well, but do yeah. you have any tips? Yeah. Um... You know, you're always a little hesitant to give tips uh, clinically when we don't really know the child, right? Because obviously it can be very complex. Um, there is some evidence that some children are just early, they just wake up early. <laughs> and we just have to learn to, you know, teach them strategies uh, so that they're not disrupting the rest of the family. However, having said that, there's also kids who could sleep longer and probably most of them can. Um, and they really have to get into those behavioral strategies. And we, we use two different approaches. One is kind of a more gradual approach and one is a more um, you know, direct approach. But I would really suggest um, A, maybe participating in our study because that's one of the areas that we focus on or talking to a healthcare provider about that. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, quick and easy solution. It's really about building in uh, wake time routines, um, making sure that the sleep is the right duration at the right time. So there's lots of things you can kind of um, look at to try to improve that sleep. From, on a personal note, both of my kids were 5.30 a.m. risers for at least the first five or six years of their lives and they finally grew out of it, so. <laughs> no, no, that's right. And and. You know, I was thinking that my son's a, a young adult now and, you know, doesn't like to get up. Uh, yeah. And I thought back to those early years when I, you know, would have probably loved to have been able to sleep in a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it does change. So some of it might be just, uh, you know, time and development. But five is early. And, you know, I think you could work on trying to extend that a bit at least. Um, the next question is from a, a pediatric clinical pharmacist, and he, is, he comments that he's glad to learn that medications are a last resort, or should be the, the last resort and not the first. He's just sort of wondering, just in general, do you have any any tips on balancing treatment for, for a disorder with sleep? So where the treatment and maybe the pharmaceutical treatment affects mm. sleep versus, you know, treating the disorder itself or, or, and, and supporting their sleep. Just any any advice there from the pharmaceutical perspective? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So the the one I'd be most familiar with would be uh, in ADHD children with ADHD. So uh, you know some of the stimulant medications can impact uh, sleep onset ability to fall asleep at night. And so you know if that's happening, we often look at moving the medication a little earlier or changing the type of medication that might have a, a shorter effect, um, a time effect. So you can kind of adjust it, but it is it is a balance. So what's the benefit that they're getting from the medication treating whatever symptoms you're treating versus the impact in sleep? You know, and we have to be really careful because if they're getting some benefit, like say for example, um, with, with uh, medication for ADHD, they're be able to pay attention better. Um, but if they're not sleeping, 
then their attention is going to become worse, right? So we really do have to find that balance. But I don't think there's, um, you know, it's really a trial and error and very individual. But, you know, trying to get the best out of both, I think, you know, trying to maximize the benefits while uh, decreasing the, the the negatives. I don't know if Shelly joined on the line yet. I don't know if her flight landed, but she may, as a physician, she may have more um, input into that. Yeah, I don't see her uh, in the panel uh, yet, so uh, I, I don't I don't think she's going to be joining us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there was a question that came in regarding the study, the NDD study, just wondering about developmental coordination disorder and if that would exclude or inc be included in the study. Yeah, so um, a child has to have uh, one of those four diagnoses um, as their primary diagnosis. If a child had a developmental coordination disorder in addition to one of those, that would not exclude them. Um, but if their only diagnosis was a developmental coordination disorder, they wouldn't be eligible. All right. Um, the next question is asking about the, uh, the typically developing component of uh, Better Nights, Better Days and just uh, wondering, uh, since it's completed, how can they access that? I think you had mentioned that you're still sort of working through some of the final results. So I'm just, I think they're just wondering what, what, what is available uh, from that initial study. Yeah, so, so we're hoping to, it's, it's uh, those actigraph, uh, you know, so we collected actigraphy data on uh, you know, 500 and some odd, 500 and whatever it was, uh, children at three different time points uh, for seven days at each time point. So you can imagine analyzing that data is, uh, and scoring that data is really uh, time consuming. And so that's, we're almost finished that. And then we'd be uh, moving into doing the analysis and, and publishing that uh, data. Um, Assuming that it's uh, effective, which you know, I think um, at least the positive, the qualitative feedback has indicated uh, that most likely it is. Um, we would be hoping to move this into more of a commercial uh, domain so that we can get it out there um, and trying to keep it at a really uh, you know low cost so parents can access it. You know, not much more than buying a book or something like that. Um, and also having uh, like a sliding scale, I guess, or uh, for families who can't afford it, that there's going to be a way uh, to access it. Um, so we're hoping to launch that if it if everything goes according to plan and everything works out um, at the World Sleep Conference in Vic Vancouver, which is in September, um, after, so after the summer. So another few months and then it should be available. All right. Um, the last question is more around tips around getting kids to nap better. She says her daughter screams until she goes down, wakes up upset, so she's almost given up on naps. She's three, and they're waiting on a diagnosis, so they don't have a diagnosis yet. So I don't know if you want to go through tips here, but there is the sleep resources document that's in the handouts and will be available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Is there anything specific in that in that resources document? Um, any books or, or 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 things that you would suggest for this kind of a thing? Yeah, I don't know what diagnosis they're waiting for, but um, the Autism Speaks uh, uh, website has a really great resource for sleep in children with autism, but I think many of the principles work for children with neurodevelopmental disorders generally, so I think that would be a great place to look. I think it's wonderful that uh, this parent is trying to get their child to have naps because we often give up on naps. Um, and think that maybe that means that they'll sleep better at night, but in fact, it doesn't work that way. And lots of times it means that they'll be too tired and too irritable to fall asleep at night time. So continuing to try to get a, a three-year-old to nap, I think is a really uh, good goal. And using some of those strategies in the Autism Speaks uh, uh, sleep information might be really helpful. Yeah, and that link to the Autism Speaks information is in that uh, handout that's, uh, that PDF that's in, in the handout section. So if you just click on that and download it, you'll see it uh, part way down there. So, yes. uh, and with that, uh, I think that's all the questions that we have here. We're a little bit over time. So I'll just hand it back to you, uh, Penny, one last time. If uh, there's anything you'd like to leave uh, the audience with, you've sort of told us what's coming for the Better Nights, Better Days study and when we might see that launched at the World Congress there. But is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with any key messages or anything before we sign off? Yeah, I, I just, I suppose, clarifying that the uh, version for typically developing children um, sh will be launched, but we are actually currently um, recruiting parents for the children, for the uh, 
neurodevelopmental disorder version. So um, for all those parents who have joined in, if, if this sounds like a good fit for you, we'd love to see you um, participate. You just come to our website, you'll see a little cloud that says, I, I wanna participate, click on there, and it will lead you through the steps. And if you're a healthcare provider, um, you know, feel free to, to share the information. If you need any more information, uh, feel free to email us at uh, the uh, email listed here and we would send you uh, whatever you need in order to share this with your, your clients and your patients. And uh, again, just thanks for joining in and listening and I thank you uh, at, uh, at Children's Healthcare Canada for the opportunity to talk about this, this uh, project and sleep in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, again for a great presentation. It's always great to hear uh, what you're up to at the Better Nights, Better Days team. And and hopefully next time we bring you back, we'll get to have Shelly on with us with us again as well. Yeah, and hopefully sure. she's landed safely somewhere. Uh, in the country. <laughs> well, she's in Newfoundland, I think, is where she's going. So hopefully. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. All right. Uh, so for everyone else, we do our uh, webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, when you do get to watch live, as you can see, you get to add your comments and discussion and questions to the discussion, which really enriches the presentation. But when you can't watch live, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we do record these sessions and make the recording available on the Knowledge Exchange Network, as well as any other resources that were, uh, were given uh, for the presentation. And the Knowledge Exchange Network can be found at ken.childrenshealthcarecanada.ca. Uh, next week, our webinar will be, uh, we'll be talking on April 10th, we'll be talking about quality improvement, getting buy-in at the front line level. And we'll be welcoming Kim Pike, who's the Regional Director of Emergency Services and Ambulatory Care from the Janeway Children's Hospital in St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, and how the Janeway Emergency Department held a uh, number of quality improvement strategies to increase staff knowledge of quality improvement, help identify gaps in services and other areas for improvement. Uh, this session, uh, this presentation, a short version of it was part of our What Changed My Practice session at our conference back in October. And it really started a discussion about sort of practical things that we can do uh, to move beyond conversation and, and, and start to apply practices in, in at the front line and in this case quality improvement practices as they relate uh, to frontline clinicians. Uh, so it'll be a great presentation next week. Hopefully uh, uh, we'll see some of you back here next week but thanks again uh, for joining us today. Bye everyone.